You are listening to the Primitive Intelligence Podcast, episode 506, Building a Better Market, with my guest, Noah Healy. You may remember Noah from last week when he shared his insights on simulation theory. I may have mentioned that that was a very long conversation we had. It was almost an hour and a half. The simulation theory conversation was towards the end of that. The beginning was about his work and what he does, and it's far too important to have mixed in with my silliness and simulation theory. Noah is working on building better financial systems and market systems for things like commodities using algorithms and his background in mathematics and game theory and things like this. Far too important to have mixed in with simulation theory. So we're going to focus on that today, his main objectives and what he does. He was nice enough to talk simulation theory with me, but that wasn't why we were talking. This week is why we were talking. Before we get into that, though, I want to talk about the podcast for a second. If you've listened from the very beginning, from season one, or if you're a new listener and you've been going back and looking at old episodes to see what it was like in previous seasons, you may have noticed a very short, abrupt season three. It was only three episodes up until, well, yesterday. That is season three, Outcast. And originally, Outcast was a video live stream over on YouTube. My goal was to do that live stream and then bring the audio out and turn it into a podcast for season three. It became pretty clear pretty quickly that the live stream format with a live chat going on and all of that didn't make itself conducive to easy editing into a podcast. So I wound up stopping at three episodes. Now with the magic of AI, I use a system called Descript. It allowed me to take all of the dead airspace that would have been filled by video-related things, visual things, and all of the ums and ahs that are caused by being asked questions in chat that I wasn't prepared for and things like that, and edit all of that out, clean up the audio, and turn it into a better podcast. You can definitely tell there's some AI interaction in some of the clips, but it's way better than it was. So season three, I completely remastered this weekend. It's now, instead of three episodes, it's the full 16 episodes that I envisioned it to be. I've got them all up. They're prepared to stream. If you subscribe or follow the feed in your podcast player and you start seeing notifications for additional episodes this weekend, that was why. If you're interested, go ahead and check them out. For me, it's just peace of mind knowing that that season is actually now completed and I don't have to worry about it anymore. (laughs) And now with all that out of the way, we're going to jump into the main part of the episode. My interview with Noah Healy on the Primitive Intelligence Podcast starts now. So it's my pleasure to introduce this week's guest, Noah Healy. And um, I'm going to go... Just off the top of my head here and say you're probably way smarter than I am on a lot of this, so I'm going to do my best to keep up. Um, so if you would just want to tell us a little bit about yourself, and um, we'll just jump right into it. Sure. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, so you got my name already. Uh, I was born and raised here in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, went to UVA and been working in computers for the last quarter-ish of a century and uh, also my hobby is computational mathematics. And about a decade ago, I discovered a better way to do price discovery for commodity and some other financial markets. And so I've been working to get economics upgraded. That's, and that's uh, something that desperately needs to be upgraded. As a, as a business owner myself, I, I know it's, it's uh, not well prepared right at the moment. <laughs> It really does. Uh, Unfortunately, the existing marketplaces were created in a time before computers were conceived of. And it turns out that the, the way that they operate isn't robust to the capacities that computers have. And so the markets are becoming less predictable and more expensive, uh, and are going to continue to do so until they hit whatever the breaking point of the economy is, unless we develop better algorithms uh, to do price discovery. Now, you deal mostly, well, almost exclusively with commodities. Uh, well, commodities are the simplest 
uh, marketplace in terms of intentions and rewards. So with okay. a commodity, you have essentially a group of people that makes the stuff and a group of people that uses the stuff up. And those two groups have a common interest in common knowledge about what price that they both are interested in. Uh, in a in a equity, say, where mostly it's getting recirculated, the buyers and sellers actually don't have a common interest in common knowledge in some cases because they would each benefit from uh, – having circumstances be such that the other side was uninformed. Uh, so in, an, in, a, in a pure equity environment with full recirculation, uh, trading is only valuable when the counterparty is un uninformed. So what got you interested in that exactly? Like what was, were you in, in business for yourself and realized things were that bad and your background brought you to that? Or what exactly took you in that direction? Nope. Uh, so as I'd said, my hobby is computational mathematics. I was interested in the problem of finding consensus, consensus information on networks. And I was thinking in terms of Internet of Things and mid to large size company project management. Uh, I, I worked for a number of companies that, that either failed outright or failed to meet their very reasonable objectives because management made decisions that computer files that they they owned, that the company owned at any rate, uh, directly contradicted the sense of those decisions. But the contents of those computer files were not available to management. Uh, and so they went ahead and did these things that made no sense uh, because you just can't know everything. Uh, and we now have much, much more information than we can sort of stuff into our brains. So yeah. finding finding algorithmically clean mechanisms for wide-scale consensus circumstances looked like, one, an interesting area to think about, but also potentially a economically useful area to think about with, you know, drones, uh, sensor sensor arrays, low, low power sensors, and just more and more complex human social uh, uh, entanglements. And so after I'd found my approach, uh, I call them negotiation games. It's basically an adaptation of a particular class of, of games in game theory known as coordination games. Uh, I was having a conversation with a friend, and as a result of that conversation, I had an intuition that you might be able to build a marketplace, like a financial marketplace, out of this approach. And I pursued it essentially as an intellectual exercise. Um, I, like many, have had sort of taken introductory econ and was aware that it was universally believed that markets are perfect, um, and there's a proof to that effect that sadly has an assumption that's been falsified by the existence of computers. But, you know, the, the people that, that came up with the proof computers didn't exist yet. So, you know, uh, what are you going to do? Right. I was thinking that if this approach did approximately as well as, as the existing marketplace, that would be a massive validation of the approach. So if you have something you know is perfect and you have another approach that when applied to this situation gets you within 10% or 1% or whatever of perfect, then that's a pretty good approach that you could then apply to other types of, of things. Um, right. I was pretty surprised once I wrote up the code that does what mine does and ran, you know, trials on it to see what sort of capacity it had, that it had hundreds of thousands of times the capacity of the existing models. Uh, so <laughs> you was, kind of think I messed something up? <laughs> uh, not, not really at that point, because I'd, I'd been sort of working on it for a few months. And so, so I'd I'd gone through I'd gone through a lot of the uncertainties before I 
I sort of got that number back. Like by the time I got to there, I was pretty sure there was there was something special happening. But once I right. once I had those numbers, it was like, well, this is this is crazy. Like we this is this is so much better than what we have. And then uh, as part of the process of trying to bring these things to the world, uh, I sat down and re-researched the history of the existing marketplace and sort of how they worked and talked to people inside and so on. And that's when I stumbled over the, the proof and the problems with the proof and the difficulties with the algorithm and, and sort of discovered it's, it was a, it was a problem space that looked like it was interesting to think about. And then it was a solution to a problem that nobody asked for. And then researching the structure of that solution led to the discovery that it was a, it was the only known solution to a problem that we all very seriously have now. Okay. So basically <laughs> like you're saying, nobody, when this was all first conceived, no one even thought about computers. So when, by the time you came along with this, you were working from uh, leaps and bounds above what previously came before. Our current market design is about eight centuries old and actually, Sounds about right. actually historically we do not ascribe our market design to any given person. We, the, the, the historical consensus is that the existing market was an accident. Uh, it was a confluence of coffee houses, chalkboards and Italian culture caused the market to happen. Right. Uh, and so it has, it has a, a quite literally mythic status within economics that this accident also turns out to be perfect. Um, and if it were the case that the returns that people got from being informed were always related to the costs that the market imposed on people who are uninformed, then everything would be copacetic. But information can be useful and can also be useless. So there's noise, which is something that economics doesn't really acknowledge uh, particularly well. Although you'd said that you were a, a cable technician, you're probably familiar yeah. with the difficulties of noise and transmission. Um, oh yeah. And, uh, and yeah. And the market had a noise suppression characteristic back when it was just people. But now that we have computers, uh, the costs that the marketplace can impose on noise, uh, have greatly diminished and in some cases even vanished. And, by shoving noise into the marketplace, financial insiders make the market less predictable and consequently more expensive for financial outsiders. And so there's a, there's an approach that's available to literally everyone, uh, to, to c drag the, the economy inside the financial system and, and then take a share of that financial system for yourself. And there's no bottom to that, that sequence within our present market structure. Uh, and we have seen over the last 40 plus years at this point, uh, precisely that happening with the financial system as a whole growing as a fraction of our economies. And the, I don't know if the reason why is this, but uh, the base fact is that the technological availability makes inevitable uh, that people interested in their own incomes will cause that outcome. And so, so your this system is going to make this better for everybody. It's going to make it easier for someone like me who, it, hearing what you're saying, a lot of it is kind of like going right over my head. <laughs> like, I, I know, I know what you're saying, but, uh, so for someone like me, it might make it easier for me to get into, uh, a better way of managing my own finances through. Uh, yeah, market. well, at, at the end of the day, the, the service that the financial industry provides is information. And so right. if everyone 
has access to correct pricing data for everything in the economy at all times, then they can always make the best decisions they're currently personally able to make for their own financial future. And it is the provision of that information, which it would be the ideal of finance. Now, providing that information is, is for everything too expensive and in any rate too difficult. But uh, commodities, as I said, is sort of the simplest and basic pieces. So figuring out what food and energy and shelter and clothing actually cost um, and making that universally available uh, is the, the first necessary step to creating sensible supply chains, functioning economies, growing opportunity, and all the rest of it. Is this something that you've got implemented right now, or is this still in the building process? Code that will do the computations required for my system to operate exists and has been written. Um, organizations that offer markets that have this technology in it, that's, that's what still has to happen. Um, there are a handful of people around the world that are trying to build those organizations, but building markets is a different thing than just having the code in place. Uh, you've got to get the customers. There's regulatory compliance. That stuff requires contacts and expertise and most of all money uh, that I do not have. And so I need, I need partners to license to or, or otherwise group up with to be able to make these things happen. All right, so not, not something you just drop into the existing markets and make it work. Something you got to kind of build the infrastructure in the, the situation around. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so that's, that's where the challenge is now. Sounds like a pretty big challenge. It's not small. Uh, the, the upside is that we don't need the big markets and we don't need all of any, ex any given market to get going. Um, so for example, there's a guy I'm working with out of Switzerland, uh, and he's attempting to set up a coffee index in East Africa. Um, so this wouldn't be all the coffee in East Africa. It would be an index that East African farmers in the, in the countries that he's targeting would be able to utilize. Um, and, and he already has a online farm sale, uh, you know, presence where that's his sort of primary business. Uh, so he may well be able to get over that hump. And it would seem to me that if, even if it's just one person right off the bat, other people are going to see the effectiveness of this and how much you can save and how much easier it makes things. And they're going to want to get on board with that, I would imagine. Well, that's, that's true that there, there should be a massive snowball if it works even remotely as well as I'm talking about. Unfortunately, marketplaces aren't a one person deal. Uh, and this marketplace doesn't scale down as well as existing market models do. And so this does require a couple of dozen people to sort of get on board or on each side, the buyers and sellers to get going. Um, so, right. you know, 50 ish rather than one ish. Uh, whereas <laughs> with the existing market model, if you've got cash and self-confidence, you can actually start a marketplace yourself by just going out and buying stuff and then convincing yourself that you're going to be able to sell it to other people for more later. Um, you you and, do that all the time now with the uh, drop shipping and kind of a yeah. similar, smaller version of what you're saying, but yeah, it's people just go out and do their own thing and not really knowing what they're doing. Right. Exactly. Uh, and most of those people wind up, you know, going bankrupt, uh, unless they can somehow game the, their supply chain. Uh, so two of the most famous people that did exactly that, uh, would be Jeff Bezos and Michael Dell. And in both cases, they exploited uh, loophole slash criminal activity in other people's supply chains in order to get the get the products at at low enough prices for them to actually, you know, stay in business. Yeah, yeah. I I, I have a business that I make uh, outdoor gear, hammocks, and stuff like that, um, and it's all 
custom order things, but my biggest biggest hurdle is always finding the best price. So I can I can stay competitive as a small business price wise, but still make enough money to make it worth my while. So, I mean, it's not commodity. I'm, I'm dealing mostly in, in textiles and it makes it more difficult. But yeah, if you don't have the right, uh, the right supply chain, and even when you think you do, you can always find a better price. And it's when you're doing that yourself, it makes it difficult. Yes. Yeah. And well, so what a commodity marketplace would do within that textile space, it would eliminate that price differential ability of your business. So if you were, say, out competing another hammock provider based on your superior ability to find lower prices, you would now all be paying the same prices for the same textiles, essentially, because it'd be commoditized. And that's what would happen. Within my system, your superior knowledge could actually still be rewarded by operating through this negotiating windows. Essentially, what I've come up with is a third role in the marketplace. It's not just buying and selling. There's also a information negotiation uh, part of the market. And so my market is actually split into those three pieces where negotiators are coming up with the price that everybody will be paying. And then buyers and sellers decide how much they would like to participate at the prices that are available. So the incentive is to find the price where buyers and sellers want to match at the highest level possible. That to me, that makes, that would make things so much easier because I could spend less time (laughs) bargain hunting and more time actually producing. Well, exactly. Yeah. For, for people whose productive advantage is that they're productive, um, spending less time with the financial system makes them more money. So you, you said in the start there that you're, you're a, a recreational mathematician. It's your hobby. Math. <laughs> That's a yeah. heck of a hobby. <laughs> what got you into that? Uh, I don't recall a time when I did not find mathematics enjoyable uh and i was gradually taught that it was also a respectable use of time so i (laughs) spent my time doing it it's i mean there's there's worse things you could be doing yeah absolutely yes i did see um that you uh, one of your inspirations uh for what you do was alan turing uh, yeah, well, that I, I regard uh, Turing's insight as the most profound idea that people have had so far. And I think there's an argument to be made that it's the most profound insight that it's actually possible to have, because what the mathematics of computation does is essentially mathematicizes philosophy. Um, there's there's debate with AI these days about whether or not machines can think or are thinking. Um, Turing claimed to be relatively disinterested in that. I think that's a good attitude to have. Uh, but it is the case that very simple descriptions of very simple mechanical devices are are capable of anything that can be described to them. And our computer technology is in large measure based off that. Um, There are programs called interpreters, which have become extremely popular. And what an interpreter is, is is a program that when you tell it a program, it acts like it's the program you told it to be. So, uh, you have a program, you tell it what a web browser does, it becomes a web browser. You tell it what a uh, you know spreadsheet does, it becomes a spreadsheet. You tell it what a first person shooter game does, it becomes a first person it becomes that first person shooter game. Um, that's not limited to, you know, screens and and uh and swipes and that kind of stuff that's a general property of a certain kind of recursive system so there's people working on 3d printers that can produce copies of themselves 
uh, they're getting fairly close. And then if you add AI onto that, where it can, it can adapt and learn, it can create a better version of itself, which can then build a better version of itself, which could then build, you know, how far does that go? Potentially, yes. Well, the thing is, um, there, there aren't limits, uh, to how far that goes. Uh, the limits instead are within the incomprehensibility of these machines themselves. Because the second thing Turing discovered was that one, you could actually describe this thing that could be anything you could actually imagine, and then discovered that there were things that it couldn't do. There were quite literally limits to human imagination, and not just human imagination, imagination itself. That there are, that with the ability to do anything imaginable, there are still things that you couldn't accomplish. Um, and over the course of the 20th century, we've actually dis discovered a few practical things that we'd really like to do, like make bug-free software uh, that are on that list. And we're, we're having a hard time doing it. <laughs> Yes, but the important thing is that we're having a hard time doing it. Uh, I think I said this before the, the call. As a practical matter, it's very difficult. As a theoretical matter, it's actually impossible. Um, right. So there's uh, there's a class of, of problems called NP. Um, and things like scheduling routing for airlines is an NP problem. And okay. NP problems are very difficult. In in theory, it takes exponential time to find the solution. But it turns out that if you're willing to take an approximate solution, there are very quick and easy solutions that, that will tell you what the approximately right answer is. And when I say approximate, I mean things like to within one part of a million of perfect or one part of a billion of perfect. Right. So Yeah, perfection is no is right. needed. In, yeah. So You've got some system where you're trying to route through a hundred cities. If you're willing to get to within one part in a thousand, uh, that will take a few seconds. If you want it to be perfect, it won't happen within the lifetime of the universe. Which one do you want? Right. Um, exactly. So, so that, that on, you know, theoretically difficult or theoretically impossible isn't always the same t thing as, as practically difficult or practically impossible. But in the case when, of when I did cable, yeah, no, go continue, continue. Well, yeah, in the case of, in the case of debugging code, um, in many cases it is, it is practically extremely difficult to impossible and theoretically absolutely impossible. So, so it's, right. it's a, it's a hard barrier. When, when I did cable, one of the things I, I was in charge of was routing technicians on their jobs. And in the beginning, you look, you're trying to get all the technicians to the spot they want to work in and the jobs next to each other. And you just can't do it. And at some point you just learn close enough is good enough. You know, they're, 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 they're it's pretty good <laughs> and it's a lot faster. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, you, you have run into, uh, you have run into a classic problem in computer science. <laughs> it was with paper in uh, uh, locations. Yeah. Um, so I, I just covered uh, AI a couple episodes ago and I, what I found was very similar to what you're saying, just in a little bit of research uh, that what we have now for AI is interesting, but ultimately kind of useless as far as the consumer something for someone like me, who's just going in to mess around with that. I've been able to do a couple of interesting things like for my website, I was able to have it create a, uh, a, a web player that I could plug into the website that would just pull my latest episode. That was great. I still had to tweak it to make it work. But as I, I wound up watching the uh, Senate committee hearing with um, Altman and Marcus, and I forget her name from IBM, um, and they all had a lot of concerns about not so much what we have now, although it is it, it can sway people's opinion it can't do things that are that it could be very very bad but as it gets to the general ai and i don't know what the what the leaps and bounds of, you know in the code would be for something like that but how dangerous that could be and 
I guess, I guess trying to tie that into what you're just saying, how does, how does making perfection not perfect help that? Like how, how is getting close enough make that so it's not dangerous? Well, the, the pure fact is that computation itself is dangerous to our existing institutions to the extent that essentially our existing institutions don't actually exist anymore. Um, it's, it's like, you know, dialogue from some bad action movie. They're dead. They just don't know it yet. Right. Uh, so we've just been talking about how marketplaces are declining in value and consequently becoming more expensive. Um, this, this is a thing that's replicated across essentially all fields. So politics, uh, you know, the, the Senate calls in the heads of these AI houses to comment on what's going on. None of them brought up the very clear fact that with functioning large language models running bot networks, it becomes uh, practical and inexpensive to create echo chambers around each individual person on their social media. So everybody could have hundreds to hundreds of thousands of followers subtly chipping away at their points um, or, or comments and posts to influence their opinions about things that could just be normal. Um, what does, what does political debate look like if human beings essentially only ever engage with robotic communications, uh, which could have any one of, a, you know, infinite number of, of different motivating perspectives that are involved. Um, we, we probably haven't done that yet, uh, but we certainly can't discount it. <laughs> For certain, well, no. uh, uh, you know, like the, we don't hear about it too much anymore, but before Elon, you know, bought Twitter and renamed it to X, he was arguing that 90% of the, the thing was botted. Uh, and they were like, no, 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 it's, it's 5% or whatever their number was. Um, yeah. well, that's bad, right? <laughs> People think that they're thinking <laughs> that they're thinking and talking to human beings. We're yeah. not. Well, uh, and that, that's been for a while. I mean, when I, I've watched uh, people on YouTube debating uh, videos that they've watched and, and what's being said and what's being shown, and it's clearly all generated content. And so they're debating something that's not even real. Yeah, and how well, often does that happen? That's the point I quite frequently make with people is uh, whatever science fiction scenario of what if and could that and will this, um, most of this stuff is of the past. Deep fake has been around for something like a decade now, and it's gotten mm -hmm. pretty good for some people. So you can't see audio video presentations and know for certain that they are what they are and not CGI. Um, yeah. You were talking about YouTube. One of, one of my favorite YouTube videos I've ever seen uh, was a guy who was purporting to be a professional photographer talking about the moon landing. And his point was that because of the bizarre path of technology, while he doesn't know whether or not NASA actually launched people to the moon and landed there. And he's no fan, according to him, of the, the military industrial complex. He does know for absolute certain that in 1969, it would be easier to get footage of men walking around on the moon by building a rocket and flying to the moon than it would be to fake it in the studio because studio filming techniques just weren't that great yet. Uh, whereas yeah. today, uh, studio filming techniques are so fantastically good that teenagers might well be able to produce fully credible moon landing footage, you know, as yeah. a, as a hobby over a weekend. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a there's a, you know, the, the flat earth movement and, you know, they, they, their big thing is they don't trust what they're shown because everything's fake. And I, I mean, I, I'm, I, the earth's round, but I can see their point. And so <laughs> some of what they're saying that you can't always trust what you're shown, you know? 
Uh, yeah. And the other side of things is that while there isn't a great deal of practical impact so far, that a lot of that is on us and our decision not to take those practical impacts um, because some of the general techniques that have developed some of these enormously powerful game AIs uh, are actually generic strategic engines that can do a fundamentally better job of strategic decision-making than human beings can. Um, and so, whereas the generation, the previous generation of super chess engines, for example, was basically tactically superior to people. Um, I've made this point before, but back in the aughts, uh, while chess engines were significantly stronger than human players, human players didn't really learn that much from chess engines because the chess engines were making moves based on their ability to see 20 to 30 move tactical sequences that were just beyond human comprehension. And so even if you were to attempt to study what the computer was doing, you wouldn't be able to replicate it in your games because you wouldn't be able to remember all the enormous numbers of variations of whatever it is that your opponent actually did. Um, but the, the more AI-influenced current generation of super chess engines actually are strategically superior to human beings and have discovered... Or, or play using what we can identify as new principles of chess, which foundationally changed the way top human grandmasters play chess against each other, because it's just better to move certain pawns in the opening and, you know, castle less or whatever, and, and other kinds of sacrifices are happening much more often. And so... This is this has also happened in Go. In, interestingly, in Go, it's precisely the reverse. Humans are still tactically superior to the computer in Go. There are very isolated board situations where human beings can endure, can put in large amounts of effort to work out long sequences and find find slight advantages in those. But the computer's str superior strategic awareness is so great that it just never gets into those situations. So you, you get yourself at the opening of a, of a, it's called a Joseki that human beings have discovered where like, you know, you can play 50 moves and gain one point. And so about the third move into it, the computer's just like, Oh, okay, well, I'm going to move here now, like on the other side of the board, because I've discovered that, you know, that imbalance you've created there is enough that I can do something interesting here now and have it. You know, you want you wanted to have a point, take five or six, because, you know, by doing this wall off, I just, you know, found 20 points, basically, and, and right. to crush, crush you like a grape. Um, and these approaches, uh, BlackRock actually has a system they call Aladdin that uses those approaches to to plan its corporate trading strategy. Um, and they sell access to that. So it'll plan your corporate trading strategy as well. Uh, and it's, it's effectively senseless that political economic institutions, you know, if, if publicly traded companies that you buy don't have strategic engines that are making corporate direction choices for them uh, that are public and known, then it's because the idiots running them overvalue their own decision-making abilities. And we know that those are overvalued because we know that computers are better strategic engines than human brains are. So by ignoring, ignoring the thing that they don't want to use, they're hurting themselves because it's way smarter than they are. Right. It well, just shows in, their ignorance, basically. Right. Well, in the case of publicly traded companies, they're, they're hurting their clients, the, the owners of the companies. Uh, I want to thank you for for uh, coming on. Is there anything you want to? I, I saw that you do have a, a podcast. Are you, are you still doing that? The, the, uh, the, yes, what, yes, I it? am. Fourth... It's called the Fourth Age, uh, the AI Revolution. The fourth Age. Uh, a guy named Marty Weiner, uh, who's the retired CTO of Reddit, and I uh, are talking about AI and how computational technology is is 
wiping out our existing societies and what we might be able to do or really ought to be doing uh, to build societies in their stead. Excellent. Yeah, I listened to a little bit of the first episode today. I saw it and I was like, oh, let me check that out real quick. Uh, and I wanted to wanted to talk to you about that a little bit. So that's, that's pretty cool because we did touch on AI. So um, I'll, I'll put links to all this stuff in, in the bottom. Is there anything oh, else yes. that you, uh, you can send me a list of anything you want me to share or uh, for your, I don't know if you're, um, if you're ready to show anything about your. Oh yeah, absolutely. Your, your um, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. send you, um, I've got a link to a video explanation in the white paper. Uh, there's a website that explains okay. stuff. Um, Excellent. And and some contact links for myself. I'll give you all that stuff. Okay, awesome. I'll put that down there. And thank you very much for coming on. Good deal. All right. I want to thank Noah again for sitting down and taking the time to talk with me. Really eye-opening stuff on some of the concepts he's talking about. Like, we don't know where the market came from. Nobody really knows who came up with all this stuff. We just go with it because that's what's in place. And to just have that foresight to go ahead and say, hey, I think I can do this better and and do it is incredible. So thank you very much, Noah. It was great to sit down and talk to you. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know what you think about the interview format. I'm working on setting up a few more. I've got a bunch of more topics that I'm researching and getting ready to record. Cruising right along with season five. I'm really enjoying myself. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to it. That's going to do it for this week's Primitive Intelligence Podcast. Enjoy the rest of your week. See ya.